I'm your Dungeon Master, Scott Forsyth, and welcome to Forsyth Fantasy Hour Recaps. FFH Recaps tell the summarized stories of the different campaigns told throughout Forsyth Fantasy Hour. This recap focuses on episodes 1 through 7 of Hilltopper and Pilgrim Season 1, and these episodes tell the story of Emmy and Jack's adventure at the Barbarian's Ball, and marks the very first arc done on FFH. Our story starts in the land of No Wishing, in the town of Sundew. Jack Pilgrim has lived in the village for about three weeks now, becoming fast friends with Emmy Hilltopper and Ander Alexander Stormborn. While in Sundew, Jack is still searching for information about the Paladin Pilgrim's Order, the same friend that left Jack the mysterious gifts, the Paladin's cloak, the Paladin's gauntlet, and a smoky orb. So Emmy does her best to gather information for Jack about the Paladin's Order. However, nothing comes up for the duo. The only clue they have is Jack's smoky orb, the smorb as he calls it, glows faintly around different areas of Sundew. Despite that, no other information has come to light, and the duo takes a break from the search. Yimrick the Brain, one of the goblins that helped Emmy in the first Wellforge hunt, comes to meet Emmy and Jack, offering them a job. The job is a heist at a local and prestigious gala made for criminals and bandits, called the Barbarian's Ball. There is a philosopher's stone being smuggled into the ball, and Yimrick wants it for himself. He also claims that he's worried it might get into the wrong hands. Along with obtaining the stone, Yimrick requests that Emmy and Jack find some of his associates that made for the stone a few nights ago, who he hadn't heard back from yet. With their job clear and already paid for, Emmy and Jack set up for the job and are accompanied by Droopy, the goblin child, and Roderick, the cursed winter wolf, who Emmy can talk to telepathically now due to a newly required magic crown. The Barbarian's Ball is located in the city of Sixport, and while on the road, the crew is assaulted by a masked bandit. The bandit demands to know where they found Roderick, because he's worried Roderick might have been stolen from a poaching group. Using magic, Emmy was able to calm the bandit down, who revealed himself to be a fire genasi named Totem. Even though he wore a mask, Jack believed he knows Totem, for he might be Grey Orange, one of the seven urchins Jack grew up with. Now nearing dusk, the party made it to the Barbarian's Ball. Their plan was for Emmy and Jack to sneak into the building while Droopy and Roderick guarded their getaway wagon, which was tucked away in a back alley. Emmy and Jack found a secret passage that led into a basement, which was being used as a storage center for a medley of animals. One of these animals was a displacer beast and got loose and attacked the guards. Using the noise as cover, Emmy and Jack escaped the room and found a makeshift holding cell. In the cell is a goblin named Spleen, who is an associate of Yimrick and is one of the people they were supposed to find. Spleen explains that the other night, himself and two others tried to steal the stone for Yimrick, but were caught and killed by the hostess of the Barbarian's Ball, Irva Mooncarin. Spleen was the only survivor and warns the heroes not to mess with Irva and informs them that the stone isn't a philosopher's stone. This stone does not change items into whatever the user wants. It instead transforms any organic material it touches into stone. As he reveals his hands, which have been fused together by grabbing the stone, Spleen also informs the duo that the stone is going to be put on a bidding auction tonight at the Barbarian's Ball. Emmy and Jack take Spleen to the secret passage to escape, but are stopped by the freed displacer beast. The heroes fight off the beast and use Spleen's stone hands to change the creature into stone. But with all of the commotion, a disgruntled human comes down into the basement. This human is a beastmaster slash poacher who was hired by Irva to entertain the guest of the ball and to act as security. Now, he knows who Emmy and Jack are and calls them out by name because his name is Nicholas Stormborn and is the half-brother to Ander. So Nicholas is furious at the party, but strikes a deal with them. In exchange for not telling Irva that they are here, Nicholas wants Emmy and Jack to pay him a hefty fee for killing the Displacer Beast. He also wants them to take him to Sundew to go talk to Ander, 
Free knows that if he walks into Sundu alone, Andor will just throw him out of the town. Finally, Nicholas has heard that a vigilante named Totem is set to crash the ball and attack Nicholas. So he wants the duo to kill Totem. Despite the outrageous demands, Emmy and Jack have no choice but to agree to his terms, and Nicholas leaves them in the basement. Suddenly, Jack notices that his smorb is glowing quite bright and only around Emmy, Spleen, and the Displacer Beast. Jack taps Emmy's armor and the stone creature, which causes the orb to rattle and shake until it shows a map of no wishing and creates two points of interest. Emmy recognizes one of the areas as the location of the Wellforge of Design, where she first fought the Insect Glaive. Using this logic, they deduce that the stone has come from another Wellforge, and that Jack's orb glows when it's around Wellforge-created items. The reason it glowed around Emmy was that she had been wearing a few things that were gifted to her from the Stonecutter Brothers, the ones who were using the Wellforge design as a business to enchant adventurers' items. With this new information, the party desperately wants to win the stone in the auction. But afraid of being seen at the ball, Spleen uses some magic to change Emmy and Jack's look. Now, they needed his hands to cast the spell, so Emmy had to smash his hands so that they were no longer fused together. Nevertheless, uh, Spleen's spell worked, and while in disguise, Emmy and Jack explored the ball. They found out where the auction would be held, and gathered a little money from some of the other attendants. As they waited for the auction, Emmy sees something surprising. She sees a dragonborn man who looks identical to Elliot, her childhood friend who she lost during the flood. She tries to speak to him, but is pushed into a crowd for the auction had just begun. The auction was led by the infamous moon elf, Irva Moon Karen, alongside a bard playing a classic 70s soul and funk. Hey, that's what happens in the fantasy hour. And the audience loved the auction and competed with Emmy and Jack and other people for some of the items. In the end, Jack actually won the bid for a magic sword, but it was the stone that was saved for last. When Irva presented it, she confirmed that it came from a Wellforge. A Wellforge that she found, which was called the Primordial Forge. Now, surprisingly, the auction for the stone went poorly because despite Irva's flash and show, no one wanted to bid on the item. Frustrated, she told the guards to bring out Spleen as a demonstration of the stone's power. As the guards left, Emmy and Jack tried to create a distraction, but ended up blowing their cover. Luckily, Totem came crashing in. Totem leapt onto the chandelier above the auction, acting much more differently than when Emmy and Jack met him on the road. He was brash and overconfident, as he informed all the criminals there that District 6, Sixport's police force was on their way to arrest them all. And then the chandelier collapsed. All hell broke loose afterwards, with Totem and Nicholas fighting, Emmy and Jack running for safety, and Irva using the stone to show the auctioneers its true power and to not look like a failure. Doing this, she became a 20-foot tall monster encased in stone and began attacking Totem. Amidst the commotion, Emmy ran to Elliot and told him that she used to be his friend. He said he didn't know her, and he kept calling himself Green Kid. But Emmy persisted, and her words briefly broke a mind spell over him, causing Elliot to remember who he really was. So with Elliot on their side, Emmy and Jack were able to rescue Totem and Spleen, and they all made their way to the secret entrance of the Barbarian's Ball. Now, down in the basement, they found something horrifying. The Displacer Beast, along with Spleen's broken hands, came back to life in a new form encased in stone. As the group dodged the stone creatures, an injured Nicholas blocked their exit. He was going to kill them when Emmy used another calming spell, letting her friends safely run past Nicholas. After everyone went past Nicholas, Jack pushed him back into the secret tunnels and tried trapping him in there. Jack was closing the entrance to the tunnel when his gauntlets, the ones he received from his paladin friend, started glowing. Just then, a magical energy blew out the supports for the tunnels, and Nicholas became trapped in the basement with the stoned monsters. Jack turned and looked at his friends in surprise, and saw the ghostly form of the paladin 
looking back at him, congratulating him. The paladin disappeared and everyone got into Droopy's wagon and escaped the barbarian's ball. While in the wagon, Elliot asked Jack about his paladin's armor, wondering if he's a member of the Departed Guardians. The Departed Guardians were a secret order of paladins that watched over and protected magical items in No Wishing, mostly protecting the different Wellforges. Totem, who reveals that he is Grey Orange, tells everyone about the original Jack Pilgrim. And our Jack explains that his real name is Rhett Matthews and that he's not a Departed Guardian. Elliot also explains that the Smorb is called a beacon and helps Guardians track different Wellforges that are active, which leads Elliot to talk about the Insect Glaive, the group he is a part of, and the reason he knows so much about Wellforges. The Insect Glaive is a group of people who want to use the power of the Wellforge for personal gain. Now, for their leader, the Hive King, his goal is to wipe out an ancient royal bloodline called the Galley. A group of elves and humans who are many of No Wishing's leaders, queens, kings, and political figures. For years, the Glaive has been on the search for these forges. And if they were able to activate all of them, the Wellforge's power will release into a final forge, which the Glaive can enter to manipulate the universe as they see fit. The Departed Guardians tried to stop them, but failed and most of them had been hunted down and killed by the different members of the Insect Glaive. Now, despite their power and ambitions, the Glaive is still a small group, with only a few extra followers and a couple leaders. Which is why Elliot was at the Barbarian's Ball. The Insect Glaive wanted him there to recruit Irva, who had reached out to the Glaive after finding the Primordial Forge, and was the reason why she was so frantic to please the auctioneers. Elliot then describes the head members of the Insect Glaive, some of which our heroes have met. The Hive King? He's the half-orc from Emmy's past, who she met outside Josephine's cabin. Zorva, the magenta moth, is the woman Jack met before arriving in Sundew, the one he fought on top of the hotel. Sylvian Valgeld, the black spider, is the dark elf wizard Emmy and Jack had both run into. And then there's Elliot, who his codename is Green Kid, who joined this group after the flood of Tranquility Bay, but he was brainwashed into serving them and had his mind and memories altered. The other head members are Jerris Click, his codename is the Crimson Weta, and Zert the Burnt Knight, who Jack and Emmy have never met. When Elliot finished, he said that he needed to go back to the glaive, well, to now keep his cover, but implored our heroes to stop the glaive and do what they can to destroy the forges. For if they can destroy the forges, they could slow down the countdown to the final forge. Emmy and Jack promised to help defeat the glaive and stop their evil plan. And while on the way back to Sundew, they parted ways with Elliot.